Hey, Tom, are you Tom, good? Introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Tom Clifton, man. Uh, pleasure to be here, Vince. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. I look forward to just sharing with you, my brother. Thanks for thanks for doing it for me. I appreciate it. Oh, my uh, pleasure. <clears throat> Tom, tell us about what you do. Uh, all the amazing things you do. Um, well, um, first and foremost, I'm a lawyer. Um, that's my primary profession. But I've been an entrepreneur probably for the last 18, 19 years. Um, a lot of what I do is business coaching, consulting, um, anything, all things small business entrepreneurship I'm into. And I'm always trying to learn more, innovate, share what I know with other people. And of course, with yourself, I'm always learning from you when we get together Thank and share you. and have our, have our mastermind going. So when you told me about this, I definitely wanted to come on because I think it's a great way and a great platform for us to be able to help other entrepreneurs, not just see the stuff that we've done, but learn from our mistakes and get the opportunity to maybe take some shortcuts by learning from us. Right. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, again, I appreciate you coming on and, and helping me with building this platform. I think it's important that we um, share our experiences as entrepreneurs with up and coming entrepreneurs, as well as the youth. You know, I'm really big on the youth not having to um, <clears throat> stay in that same cookie cutter platform that we've been accustomed to in our past, right? Well, at least, you know. So we've definitely. grown out of it. We've grown out of it and we found our way. We found our footing. And so I, I just try and talk to good brothers like yourself and sisters <clears throat> in the future and just grow the knowledge of or the, the just sharing the knowledge of entrepreneurship and going what we had to go through, what you had to overcome to get to the status we are now. And, <clears throat> and let me first start by saying you're one of the most successful lawyers in North Carolina. I just wanted to correct you on that. All right? I appreciate that. I just wanted to correct you on that because, you know, that's our thing. That's something you and I always go back and forth with. And, you know, I'm always going to... Yeah. That's the inside see, joke. That's, but see, that's the beautiful thing. That's part of the reason why I came on because you've been mentoring me on that part of it to really take the time <clears> and, and to acknowledge the success because for me, it's always been, been about trying to get to a destination and I kind of put blinders on. And if I don't watch myself, I won't take time to enjoy the small steps along the way, the, the little wins. You know, sometimes right. they can be some of your best experiences and the people that help you get to them. Like right. yourself, like I said, we mastermind on a regular basis. You know, when COVID wasn't going on, we get together almost every Friday. Every and Friday. we have, you know, hour, two hour lunch sometimes, <clears throat> mastermind and brainstorming. And, and as they say, you know, iron sharpens iron. We right. literally help each other. One of the things you've been working with me on is stepping forward on the platform and saying, okay, it's okay to say, yes, I've, I've had success. I've enjoyed a tremendous amount of success. I've been blessed. Right. And for me, I appreciate that because looking back on it, some of those days when you, when you get to the point where you say, okay, you know, this is one of those days, things are not going my way. Got to slap myself and say, oh man, look at where you come from, <clears throat> look at where you right. are. And you're absolutely right about that. So yeah, I'm, I'm thankful to be successful. I've been doing this for 18, 19 years. 2001, I, I, I was licensed to practice law mm -hmm. in the state of North Carolina. I came out and opened up a law practice all by myself, just me and the good Lord, which most people don't do. And yeah. at the time, most established lawyers wouldn't encourage young lawyers to do. Now you see yeah. more of them doing <clears> it. And I've been blessed to mentor some other young lawyers that came behind me, some older ones too, who wanted to know how I did what I did. And by the grace of God, a whole lot of hard work and just, I guess, stubbornness, <laughs> just plain no. stubbornness. And Ambition, people, I like to call it. And it, that, that's a better word for I'm, a, I'm yeah. a country boy. I'm just stubborn, man. That's what I'm <laughs> too. No, and, I think you've seen a vision and you knew what you wanted at an early age and you wasn't going to be denied getting to that point. And we're gonna get into that. I want to get. I want to start off from your upbringing. I want to start from the beginning, so people can get the more feel of, um, to get the feel of what you've been through, and what what sparked that fire to become yeah. the man you are now. So <clears throat> let us know a little bit about your upbringing. Okay. You know. uh, do, do do you want the uh, the abbreviated uh, uh, watered down <laughs> clean up version, or do you want the real? We get the watered down cleanup version, but <laughs> okay. a little bit with, with the real because we're gonna go back to it. We're gonna be jumping back and forth, okay? Because I know the story. 
I know the ins and outs of the story, and I know exactly why or, or what pushed you to be the man you are now. And what mo what 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 why that sh why that pushes you to share your motivation to others, but I, I you know I want the audience to know too like, okay. you know well you first think? and foremost I I don't sugarcoat anything I'm straightforward and okay. <laughs> I do cuss every once in a while I do no cursing but I do a little cussing every once in a while so <laughs> if, you, if you want it I'll give it to you rough rugged and raw Please I came do. up I came up dirt poor I'm the oldest of what 10, 12 kids I think total between my mom and my stepdad and I've got three mm -hmm. um, sisters in New Jersey by my dad and we were dirt poor I grew up without indoor plumbing adequate indoor plumbing for most of my life. There were some times when we did have it, but for probably from the time that I was in maybe fifth grade through my senior year in high school, we didn't. And my job every day was to take the bucket that we use as a bathroom out of the house, <clears throat> through the yard, around the dog pen, through the field, into the woods and dump it. And then get back to the house, put water on the stove, in a foot tub, heat it up and take a bath, not a shower because we didn't have a working shower. I right. did that every day, 13, 14, 15 years. That was my job. And so when you live in those conditions, you see the worst of the worst. I, I've seen spousal abuse. I've seen drug abuse. Mm -hmm. I've been abused as a child, child physical abuse and verbal abuse mm -hmm. from both of my parents, right. to be honest. Um, there was always weed in the house, alcohol in the house. The, our house was a party house. When it, On Fridays, everybody came and they smoked and they drank. And I've seen everything. And then later on mm -hmm. in life, when I got to be about 15 years old, crack made mm -hmm. its way in and it, it was a whole new dynamic because at 15, it was the first time I had to get the shotgun and run a crackhead off of our doorstep. And you're talking about somebody who was absolutely scared shitless, pardon my language, but that's the best way I can ex I can describe it. When mm -hmm. your mother grabs you and whispers, look, as a man on the doorstep that will not leave, he's looking for your daddy, he thinks he's got something in here. And you go to the door and you tell her, you try to muster up, you know, I'm 15, I try to sound, you know, generate a little bass, you know, you better get right. off the doorstep, but I'm shaking. Right. Right. And I've got the gun and it's loaded. I know how to shoot it, but I don't want to kill anybody. I'm a 15 right. year old kid, but you live through those things. I've got <clears throat> my younger sisters in that room. My mother's here. I've got younger brothers in this house. Got to protect the family. Got to protect the family. Yeah. This wasn't a one time occurrence. This was an everyday thing. There was always something. Any day, any day, any little thing could set it off. Pop could come in and if he was out, you know, on, on a bender or something like that, he beat the hell out of my mother. He beat the hell out of me. Um, there were times where we had all types of family members that lived with us and some of them were, weren't the most scrupulous people in the world. They steal <clears> from you. They, if they caught you with your back, turn, they stab, stab you in the back, whatever they could do to get themselves ahead. And growing up mm -hmm. like that, it definitely changes you. And then there was a situation when I was younger, about my fourth or fifth birthday, you asked me about what really motivated me to, to get into the practice of law. But, right. um, I told you the story a million and one times, but I'll share it with the listeners. I think it was about my fifth or fourth or fifth birthday. My, um, we stayed out in a little house way out in an area called Wood, North Carolina. It's on the other side of Centerville going toward Halifax mm -hmm. County. And a little shack we stayed in. And it's Christmas Eve. I was born on Christmas Eve. And I'm about four years old. So I'm up. I'm, I'm excited. It's my birthday. And Santa Claus is coming. And I can't oh, sleep. Wow. And there was a young lady that was there. She was a friend of my mother's. And her boyfriend and my stepdad, they were out hanging out and she had a little baby. My mother had you know, my my my, ba my brother um, prior who's under me and they were kind of commiserating together. And the lady, you know, she got pissed off. And I remember her telling my mother before she left, it was midnight. She said, whatever happens to being the baby, you tell him it was his fault. And next morning they found her murdered. She had been raped <clears throat> and been murdered. And wow. there were bloody tracks around our house. And to make a long story short, the police thought my mother knew something. And they had her arrested at one point. I, I never forget when they came and arrested her. It was about three or four months later. And they literally snatched my sister out of her arms. Mm -hmm. They caught her when my stepdad wasn't home. And they were saying all types of vile stuff to, vile stuff to her. My sister's crying. I'm four or five years old. And I'm mad, but I don't know what to do. So I'm crying. And I see my mother crying and begging and pleading these men. Please let me call my mother to come here and be with my children. Right. And that left an imprint in me. And for two, about a week, week and a half, two weeks, my mother was locked up in Franklin County Jail, the old jail, which was right behind the courthouse. Wow. And um, 
I'll never forget my grandfather and family getting together and raising enough money to hire a lawyer. They hired a lawyer named Banks. I remember mm-hmm. hearing his name, Banks, Banks. And he went in and somehow got the charges dismissed. My mother was charged with an antiquated, under an antiquated law called missing prison of a felon, which Uh basically said that if a felon is committed and we think you know something about it, we've got the right to lock you up and prosecute you and make you tell us what you know. And I never forget when, you know, she was released and she came home and everybody's so happy and I just kept telling mama, one day I'm going to get those men that did this to you. And she told me, she said, no, you know, you, if you're going to fight them, you got to learn how to fight with your mind. You go to school, you work hard because you don't fight this type of fight with your fist. <clears throat> you got to fight it with your mind. And that was the start of it for me. In my mind, J- Lawyer Banks was 10 feet tall. Little did I know that later on in life, when I came back to Franklin mm-hmm. County, he would be my mentor. He was Judge J. Henry Banks. And it's about my height, maybe a little bit shorter, kindest man in the world, but he was a giant to me. Right. And to get that opportunity to come back and fight. And I never get what my mother told me. She said, you understand what it's like. You've seen injustice. You've tasted it. You know what it does to people. Fight. Don't be afraid to fight for the people that you represent. Fight. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Fight. That's powerful. So that was your start to <clears throat> become a lawyer. That was it. Um, but you, I, I know, but let's act like if I don't know, let's talk to the people. <laughs> why you didn't go into the field, why you didn't stay in the field of practicing under someone, you took the initiative to say, no, I want to do it my own way. Um, in Franklin County at, at that, because we already know Franklin County is, is not the most diverse um, county in the world. But when I, when I came back here, there were no <laughs> black lawyers here. I was one of a kind. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but go ahead. <laughs> it's the truth. There were, no, there were none here when I got, there had been a few that come through, but nobody stayed. They would move on to right. the surrounding counties and there were various reasons why they said they didn't stay. Some of them are pretty easy to point out. I mean, you think about that statue just came down. Yes, so right. there were things here and there are things everywhere that you deal with. Um, the biggest thing that made me decide that I didn't want to continue working for somebody else, or really when I went to law school, I had the intention in mind that when I got out of law school, I, ne- I was never going to work for anybody else. I, I was walking around saying that. And it was right. funny because when I went to law school, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about law school or anything like that. I'm a poor country boy. Right. I grew up working in the in the tobacco fields, the cucumber fields, chicken houses, hog houses, doing all types of nasty jobs. Mm. I go to Elizabeth City State University, the smallest HBCU in the state, state supported school, poor section yeah. of the state. Right. And that's so I get there true. and I get a work study job. I'm on scholarship, but I get a work study job and lo and behold, I'm working for the janitor. So I'm scrubbing <laughs> toilets, sweeping floors there. I, you know, I bust my hump at uh, Golden Corral and Pizza Hut while I was working there. I'd done that in high school. And so I'm cutting hair as a hustle. Um, you know, hey, this, this is your show, so I don't, I don't mind telling this story. I tell anybody. I was selling clean urine samples at one point to the football <laughs> players because they said I was a straight arrow. And they were like, Tom, man, we give you $25. You pee in this condom because, uh, you know, the, the NCAA got the man coming tomorrow. And I've been smoking. Yeah. Like, dude, we need you to win. And so, hey, you gonna give me 25 bucks? I'll piss on the condom, on the floor, whatever you want. It don't matter to me. Give me 25 bucks. I gotta send this money home to my mom and to my pops. They need money. The family's struggling. And so from that standpoint, I was a hustler. And so, so not doing that. So, oh, go ahead. Not to cut you off, let me intervene for a second. So mm-hmm. in your, while you in college, cause this is important, I think it's, a, it's very important for, for people to understand and to hear while you're in college getting your education right mm-hmm. better than your own life you're working getting money to help support you but you're still sending money home to your family to help support the family as in in, in reality as an adolescent as a child dude that, that's the way that that's the way that i was raised we were all responsible right. um and that was the one thing that my stepdad's a hard working dude man Mm -hmm. one of the hardest working people I've known in my life. And that's one thing he instilled in us, man, get up and go to work. And so whatever they needed by that point, he had, um, he'd been stricken with diabetes. He'd almost died and he couldn't work like he used to just point blank. He was a physical laborer and did manual labor his whole life. But when diabetes hit him, it hit him hard. He'd worked for the city of Raleigh as a garbage man. He wasn't making a lot of money to begin with carrying somebody else's garbage every day. And so we had insurance and there were all types of issues that came up, legal issues for some, some of the family members. And 
I was kind of like my mother's right hand person. If if things got tight, she would call me. And anybody, if your mom calls you and you can hear her voice, you know when she's crying. You, you know what she right. needs. You know what's going on. Yeah, what are you gonna say? You're not gonna say no. So yeah, I you know, I was sending money home. That was the thing. And for me, I thought every, I thought everybody's life was like that. <laughs> and, I got, and then I started looking around, I'm like, Man, these these cats live in large. You know, they got right. nice cars, nice clothes. A lot of them living off student loans. I didn't know that. Thank yeah. God I didn't. <laughs> you know, maybe I probably would have did the same thing, but I was hustling. I worked at Golden Corral my freshman year. And I lived in a dorm with the football players, and I'm talking about I'm a, I'm a pretty nice size dude. But these dudes three four times my size, yeah. athletic, strong, violent. Man, I come yeah. home with all this all, all this chicken and stuff like that. That you know, at the end of the night. I'm good with everybody, dude. That don't nobody <laughs> touch Tom Cat. He cut my hair and he feed me. And right. don't y'all mess with Tom Cat. Tom Cat, good. Way. Yeah, I'm I'm watching dudes knock people out in the gym and take their gold and start dancing with that girl. Dude, live next door to me. <laughs> Come in my room whenever he wanted to. My man Levi. To this day, if I need Levi, I know he's gonna be right here because I took care of him. Okay. So, for me, going through all of that stuff, man, when I um. And I made it through law school, so I was like, I'm never working for anybody else again in my life. I'm going out and I'm going to start my own thing because what I had noticed over the years is that the people who had the power were the people who owned their own businesses. Mm-hmm. I didn't have aspirations to be a politician. I didn't want any of that stuff. What I wanted was to control my own destiny. Read it. Six, seven years old, man, I'm getting up every day at the crack of dawn with my pops because my alarm clock every morning was, get your ass out of that bed. What do you think you're going to lay around all day long? Right. That's what I heard every morning to the day I left home. Then I get to Elizabeth City State University and I hear, do, 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 do. Cliff, get up out of that bed. Come here, help me mop, help me mop these floors. I, the, right. the, janitor, the janitor Everett. I work for him. Then I'm at Golden Corral, busting suds, cooking and stuff like that. They tried to play me there. I never get the day I walked out of there. It was so funny, dude, because dishwasher had quit. And they let the dishes pile up. I'm a cook. I'm cooking, going away. Ain't nobody said nothing. End of the night come, the dishes piled up to the ceiling. Mm-hmm. I never get little lady gonna tell me, you know, little white lady gonna tell me you can wash those dishes. She's like, no, ma'am, I'm not. <laughs> like, well, I'll call the boss. I'm like, call her. So she called the boss. Boss is on the phone. He won't talk to you. So I talked to him. He's like, you don't wash those dishes. You ain't got a job. I'm like, bro, I got a future. I'm in college. I ain't washing right. no damn dishes. And walked out. And that was right. the end of my career with Golden Corral at that point. But I didn't care. I knew then. I was like, never again am I gonna allow somebody to dictate to me what the terms are. Now, Never say never because I did end up taking another job later on, but that's a different story. When I left law school and passed the bar, we moved back to Franklin County and um, mm-hmm. started law practice up from scratch. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew anything about me, but I would get up every day, go fight for my clients. People were laughing at me because we had the crappy. I got some of the worst cases in the world, but I'd go in there and I'd fight. And so one day the, um, the DA told me, he said, look, man, we got a position at our um, office that's coming open. Mm-hmm. And you know your clients' names. You come in here and fight for them like they got million dollar cases, and you don't. He was like, "You got a family. You're a nice guy, and I think you, it'll be good for you." And I turned it down. And they had, then his boss came, the head DA, and he talked to me. He was like, "Why don't you want the job?" And I'm like, "I don't want a job. I, you know, I'm living my dream." And I talked it over with my wife, and she was with me 100. percent And um, Judge Banks, Judge Baskerville, who was Attorney Baskerville at the time. Some of the other black lawyers set me down. Mr. Balance, God rest his soul, was a mentor to to me also. Mr. Frank Balance, they set me down and they said, look, this is a good opportunity for you. It's going to help you sharpen your skills. You're not Mm -hmm. giving up on your dream. You're just deferring a little while. You go in the DA's office, work for the state, learn the craft, hone your skills. It's Mm -hmm. a good opportunity. So I went into the DA's office with the idea in mind. I'm going to go in there and steal every bit of information that I can steal and lock it away in my mind. And then I'm leaving. When I leave, I'm going to use it against them. It was ironic because the day I got sworn in, I've got a picture of me and my mother and my sister. And I think my aunt was there and we're standing in the same spot. The first spot that I saw my mother standing when she came out of the courthouse, when her case was dismissed. So here I am, I'm prosecuting in the same Mm -hmm. DA's office that prosecuted her. And it made me feel kind of funny, but she was proud of me because she she was like, son, I know you're going to do the right thing. No matter where right. you are in that courtroom, you're going to always do what's right because you're my son. I, I raised you. And so that gave me the confidence to go in and really, you know, take the job on. So, OK, I'm going to do it right. And I did. I tried to help my people wherever I could. You know, I prosecuted. I was tough. Anybody tell I was a tough prosecutor, but I was fair minded and I always yeah. treated people with respect. 
And anytime you do that, good things are going to happen. Then the other thing was the, um, the DA that reached out to me, he was right because I had carte blanche. My boss like, hey, man, any cases come up, you want to get in, get in them. So I was taking cases that nobody wanted to try, and I was trying them. Right. Judge Banks had told me that bad cases made uh, made good lawyers. So right. I should <laughs> I should be a damn expert because I had so many bad on. cases. Yeah, but, but you know, I'd go in and fight for the people, man. I fight for my witnesses, fight for the officers that were involved, and it right. created a you know created a relationship that still carries through today. I get officers that tell me, "Man, you're my lawyer. If anything goes down, I'm calling you." I've I've represented law enforcement officers who have gotten in trouble and needed help, and yeah. you know that I that I've gone to court and fought <laughs> with back and forth because they know, man, when it come down to it, he gonna fight. That's what, that's pre- what I I, everybody appreciate that with you. And that's why I hold you in such a high regard as far as a lawyer in Franklin County. I appreciate there's two that things. To there's two things that happened. I think we skipped over. What it was and I just want you to, and I want you to touch on these two things because to me it's, it's very important. Uh, the lesson behind it or, or the, 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 the information you received. And mm. I know personally, cause we have a personal relationship. I know that these things uh, steered you in the right direction. The first, the first one was um, working at Pizza Hut. Oh yeah, the Pizza Hut when I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that. Wait, let, let me okay. finish. Let me give you yeah. next one. And the All next right. one was your law teacher in college. True, they gave you two great pieces of information they, they really that did. we just skipped over. Pizza Hut. All right, so going back mm-hmm. when I was in high school, I worked at Pizza Hut from my sophomore year all the way up to my senior year. <clears throat> And um, I never get my boss's name, Steve Byer. Steve owns a Grocery Boy Junior store out in um, out in Raleigh now. It was on Lake Willow Road. And I saw him not too long ago. A good friend of mine and guy I worked with that pizza had passed away. And Steve was the manager. And mm-hmm. when I went in, I man, I was trying my best to get a job because I didn't want to have to go back out in the fields. I was getting tired. You know, I was tired of that. I'm 15, 16 years old. I'm thinking about trying yeah. to get a car and stuff like that. And, so a buddy of mine worked there and he brought me in and introduced me to Steve. And I never forget, Steve asked me the two questions Steve asked, what well, think what Steve asked me when I came, asked me one question in the interview. Do you want to bullshit or do you want to work? And I told him I wanted to work. So I came in and he put me to the test and he liked what he saw and I worked. And I would go and I'd bust my hump. You know, we've been there 11, 12 o'clock at night on a school night working. Well, my buddy, God rest his soul, my man that passed away, he been, he was a jokester. We've been there, if it gets slow, he started joking around, doing crazy stuff, putting dishwashing detergent in the um, the dish sanitizer, and it would blow bubbles everywhere. You come in there and be bubbles all over the floor, and he just died at an eye. And when that would happen, the manager would come in, and he would tell him to go home. And so then it's just me. So I'm cooking, cleaning, and washing dishes. <clears throat> And after a couple of weeks of doing that, man, I'm struggling in chemistry class. I'm, you know, I'm doing okay, but I'm not where I'm, I'm you know, I'm not making the grades mm-hmm. I know I'm supposed to make. I'm right. tired all the time because I'm in there, you know, if he clock him out, I'm busting my hump. Now I still, I get out of there by 11, 30, 12 o'clock, I'm out. But I done doubled up, work extra yeah. hard, dog tired. I can't go home and study. I go home and crash. I'm getting up late in the morning. So finally, like, I talked to Steve about this. So I went to Steve and I said, Steve, man, you know, my man, he keep messing up and stuff. Why are you... Why you punish me when he when he mess up? You punish me. You let him go home and you make me stay here and do his work and my work too. And this day, Thomas, what did I ask you when you come here? I said, you asked me if I want the bullshit, if I want to work. He said, exactly. And what did you tell him? I said, well, I told you I wanted to work. And he said, in order for you to work, you know how much money you want to make. You got to get hours to make that money, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, now, what I need are people that are going to come in here in the hours that, that they're here. They're going to work. They're going to get the work done that I need. So he said, I want to explain something to you. He said, nobody's doing anybody any favors here. This is how it works. I need hours. You need money. You give me the hours. I give you the money. That's the reward. That's your rule. And so at that point, it made me realize, you know what? This is a losing proposition because the hours I'm giving him, I'm having to give him more than what I would normally have to. Oh, yeah. well, uh, and I'm on the as short far end as of work the stick. Goes. Yeah. I'm on as far as work, yeah. Anytime you're trading dollars for hours, you're on the short end of the stick. I don't care yeah, how many right. dollars they're giving you. Roger Goodell make $40 million a year, but guarantee he get tired of Jerry Jones at some point. Four o'clock yeah. in the morning, Jerry Jones call. I don't care what Roger doing, he got to answer that call. 
That's right. Forty million dollars, my ass. You can keep that. Ain't, ain't enough money in the world. Me and you <laughs> talk about this, Vince. You can take all the money in the world, stack it up to the moon, multiply it by a billion. You can't buy one nanosecond of time with it. That's right. Money has a price or a value that changes from day to day. Time is priceless. Priceless, right. And I learned that lesson as a 16, 17 year old kid. And, and so that when that important. hit me, extremely that's important. important. That's important as a child to learn, not even as a child, but as a kid, a young adult, let's say, teenager, yeah. to learn that, hey, I'm trading something that has, um, that's priceless for something that has a depreciating value. Depreciate, that's exactly right. <clears throat> but, and the reason, why, the reason why I wanted you to explain that story is because we are in, um, we're still in that same state at this point, right? Yep. Where we're telling our kids to, um, uh, well, most people telling their kids to uh, go get a job, a good mm -hmm. job, and we're not, and, and live your life. We're not pushing entrepreneurship. We're not pushing, um, chase your dream we're telling them go go work go trade your time for money knowing that your time runs out and you're never going to get enough money anyway but go ahead no, my, my thing i'm smiling because you know when you say that good job you know that's like that's like a, a buzzword that's like that uh, you know sh showing the pool the red flag because you know right. what i'm about to say there's no such thing there's as a no good such job thing as a good job right you know it, right. job may be a necessity but there's nothing good about it you don't own it it can, so it can be taken away from you at any time. You can't pass it down to your children. And no matter how hard you work, they're never going to pay you what you work. So what's so damn good about that? That's right. We need to stop telling, we need to stop telling that lie. Um, the other thing, you know, I bust my butt to go to college. I got a scholarship. Thank God, by the, by the grace of God, I bust my heart through college. Why would I take the tool? Your, your degree, your education is a tool. Right. Why would I take the tool that I spent so much blood and sweat equity to achieve and just give it to somebody else for 40 right. years and never even thinking about using that tool for myself. So for me, that started that fire right then and it started to grow. And right. the further I went, the more, you know, the more it was stoked. And I met mentors along the way who were entrepreneurs and they always encouraged me. I always, one thing I noticed about business owners and entrepreneurs is that they thought differently from everybody else. Didn't matter right. what color they were. They right. thought differently from most other people. They didn't have the mentality that I'm going to get in line and follow this course. They were along the lines of, I'm going to blaze my own trail. So I get to law school and I've got it in my mind. I'm going to get out, start my own law practice because it'll, it will allow me to be my own boss and have my own business. And <laughs> I got crushed because the dean, I went out and, you know, the dean would come through and talk to students and he asked us what our aspirations were. And I made a mistake of telling them, he was like, it's almost like the Christmas story when when Ralphie said, "Well, that BB gun, they're like, kids, you shoot your eyes. We're like, start your own law firm. Yeah, yeah, you gonna mess up, lose your law license, all that yeah. hard work down the drain. You're not gonna know anything. You need somebody to teach you." My academic advisor, brilliant man, one of the most intelligent people I've met in my life, he told me the same thing. I I think young lawyers should get out, go to work for somebody else first. Yeah. Well. I'm going through law school at that point. I'm like, man, this might not be the place for me because apparently they don't believe in what I believe in. But my mother taught me, no matter what the situation is, and my, my pops taught me, if you know mm -hmm. what it is that you're supposed to do, then you stand on your own if you have to. And I messed around when I was kind of moping around and um, my criminal law professor, Professor Irv Joyner, came up to me. He's like, Clifton, what's wrong? You look a little down and you know, kind of started talking to him. And I told him what the situation was. and. He got this long goatee and lean his head back. He said, well, it seems like the problem to me is, Clifton, you've been talking to the wrong people. So, well, Professor Jonah, what do you mean? So, you need to talk to somebody who's done what you've done. I said, right. well, Professor Jonah, who's that? He said, you're looking at him, son. And little did I know, one of the baddest lawyers on the planet. I mean, this guy's a legend. You see him on TV now, whenever mm -hmm. something's going down. He, you know, his thing was he, he advocated lawyers getting out starting their own law practice. Right. This man was so brilliant. He would break it down and show you if you got $60,000 a year offer back then, which was considered really good. And that wow. was only for the top students. And I was not one of the top students <laughs> that the firm you work for was going to work you so much that literally you'd be making the same thing that an assistant manager or shift supervisor made at McDonald's. And wow. he was like, that don't make no damn sense. It doesn't make sense to do that. He said, get out there and learn how to do this on your own. He said, everything you need to know is in a book. You can read, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know how to open your mouth? I said, yes, sir. He said, yeah, I can look at you, tell you know how to eat, so you know how to do that, and you can talk, so, okay. 
So he encouraged me to get out there. And he was one of the few people who did. Mm -hmm. And when I made the decision, you know, to do it, I never forget the advice he gave me was Clifton. Now, when you get out there, he said, I know you want to show everybody that you know what you're doing, but he said, you got to focus on becoming a better businessman than lawyer. And I didn't understand what he was saying at first. I'm like, why would I, you know, Professor John, I, you know, I got to show these people I know what I'm doing. Dude, they're not going to, he said, no. He said, son, it doesn't matter what you know. If you don't have customers, if you don't have a business, you're not going to be able to help anybody. That's important. And that started a lifelong obsession at that point with understanding how business works, how to build businesses, how to structure them, but also marketing and sales, because that's what it boils down to. And it created a unique situation for me, you know, starting off on my own, I had nothing. I right. had to not only work my way through, but I also had to master those concepts. And so going through that stuff, I learned, I made a lot of mistakes, mm -hmm. a whole lot of mistakes. And, but that's part of the growth process. You and I know that now, right. that probably one of the, one of the best things you can do is get out and make mistakes, make them it's early. Fair. It's yeah, make them early. Yeah, make them early. You fail. Failure is a is, is so important to success. Just fail forward. That's right. the whole thing. That's you it. want to be able to fail forward. Right. And so that for me was a catalyst also. So like I said, and, I did and, that first law firm, what? I did that for about eight months right. before I went to the DA's office. And we survived. We didn't miss any, we didn't miss any meals then either. Struggled, right. but we survived. <laughs> <laughs> and then what made you leave the the, the DA? But well, not what made you leave. I don't want to say that because I don't want to mm -hmm. get into that. I want to get into the business portion of it. Okay. What when you what what gave you the encouragement to go back on your own? Was it the fact that you knew you were being pigeon-toed in the position you're in, or and or you know that you have to that you was an entrepreneur from the heart? You know, because I think I think entrepreneurship. I think we we born with it. I don't think it's something that we learn. I think some of us, it just you you just know that they're never going to be, you know, I, they're never going to work in the system. I had to be man because you know my my uncles told me a long time ago, like boy, we can look at you and tell you love to eat, and you gotta <laughs> if you gotta eat by your hands, you are gonna starve. <laughs> like they, they told me that early. I was like I tried, man, but I couldn't. I couldn't build nothing. I couldn't eat nothing. To hear them like to me. hear them tell it, I was absolutely worthless. So the best thing <laughs> I could do was try my best to start something brain. and use my brain with it. So. But to get to your question, what, what really prompted me, and this is part of the business and the entrepreneurial process too, is mm -hmm. I enjoyed being a DA. It's the most fun I ever had practicing law because mm -hmm. I was on the state's dime. I could try jury trials, DWIs. I had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm one of those type people where when I get into something, I dive in head first and I immerse myself in it. So I'm working, working, working. And I've got colleagues around me and they don't, they weren't as... <laughs> Concerned about working as, as I was. Because <laughs> the job. Because the job. But I'm the lowest man on the totem pole in the sense that I'm getting paid the least amount out of everybody in the office. And the reason I know is because the DA's um, uh, budget is public record. Yeah. And it just got to point. I mean, I'm driving a beat up Chevy Cavalier where every time you slam the door, the back glass will pop. It's one of those hatchbacks. <laughs> the back glass will pop out. I'm, just, I'm telling the truth. It was, a, it was a hole in the gas tank, so it leaked gas. My wife was, <laughs> was cigarette and Boom, I'm like, I'm like I'm just gonna be gone. And so um, here I am, I'm the assistant DA. I'm running all over these four counties in mm -hmm. everybody's court. And I never forget, it got to a point I was, you know, I'd go and see my boss about a raise. He gave me a token raise. And I just, I never felt quite right. Something didn't feel right. There was a, a, a lady that came in and worked and I helped train her and I knew what she could do versus what I could do. And when I found out he was paying her $10,000 a year more than what he was paying me, I went off. Wow. It, it wow. really ticked me off. And I never forget the final straw came. I would go to him and mention to him, man, I need a raise. You know, I, I deserve her, not, not need, I deserve a raise. Right. And he'd give me that song and dance, I don't have any money, you just got a raise, wait your turn, be patient, all this stuff. But I'm looking at the numbers because I don't got a copy of the budget. I don't added right. everything. And everybody's name is beside their salary. So I know you did your research. I'm better than her. I'm better than her. I'm better than him. I'm better than him. Psst, no, no competition out. I work more than all of them. I'm like right. James Brown up in that courtroom. I'm getting pissed now. Sweating right. all over the place. Dude, one day I'm on, on my way to Warren County, out there in the middle of the Badlands. Mm. By the time you get to that bridge, car broke down. I had to thumb a ride to court on a garbage truck. 
Thank God for the brother that drove the garbage truck to pick me up. Took me into town, dropped me off. I went in, prosecuted. I got there. I'm, I'm 45 minutes late. I'm sweating. I smell like a garbage truck. Judge yelling at me. Lawyers trying to take advantage of me. Everybody got an attitude. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in there sweating like a slave, bro. Hot up in the little bit of ass courtroom, and I'm pissed. By the time we finish court, everybody scattered. Guess what time got to do? He got to thumb a ride. Thumb a ride back to the <laughs> car. <laughs> you know, get somebody to get him home. And I'm, you know, I'm going through that, and I'm seeing people ride by me. They partying, drinking, having a good time, and it's like this ain't right. So finally. So you know what I'm going to see? I'm going to see my boss. This time, I'm taking everything with me. So I went in, and when he told me, I went in and told him the same song as that. Look, I need a raise, man. This, when I told him that, and he told me he didn't have more money, I went off. Like, yeah, dude, you lying to me. I hate it when people lie to my face. And I told yeah. him, just like, dude, don't lie to my face. So <laughs> when, I, when he did, I threw the file in front of him. And it had his budget and everything else. First thing is, man, don't tell nobody. I didn't know. And so we started a negotiation process, and I ended up getting an $8,000 raise. Now, mm -hmm. the only, by law, he could only give me a $2,000 raise every month. So for four months mm -hmm. straight, I got $2,000 more in my paycheck. Right. But something was still off inside of me. I didn't feel right. I'm going, you know, we're living in a double wide and my family's growing and it's getting tight. Got a raggedy car. You know, I can't afford to take my wife and my kids on a vacation to the beach or anything like that. Right. And I'm looking at that. And for a split second, I'm mad at my boss. But then I go right back to that situation at Pizza Hut. And I realize I can't be mad at my boss. I got to be Eight mad at time. me. That's right. Yeah, I got I to gotta be mad at me because I put myself in this position. Mm. I gave this man authority over my life, That's over right. my time, and my family's finances. Mm. And that was the day that I knew it was time for me to go. So what I did was I got a $2,000 raise for four months mm. straight, and then I quit my job. And there were a lot of people told me, man, you're the biggest fool I've ever seen in my life. Who quits a job after getting an $8,000 raise? When I told my colleagues, the one lady I work with most of them, she cried. Because mm. we, we we worked very well together. She, she wasn't really easy for most people to get along with, but we worked well together. And we were starting mm. to have good success in Superior Court winning jury trials and stuff together. Mm. And I never forget, she looked at me, she's Thomas, you know, I'm just worried about you. She said, you've got a beautiful wife, beautiful children. She said, um, there are no black lawyers in this town and it's going to be hard for you. And she said, I'm just really afraid that your business is going to fail and you and your family are going to starve. Bro, that's been almost 17, 18 years ago. Did anybody starve yet? Do I look like I missed any meals? <laughs> Not a single yes, one. That was, that was a wrong, wrong thing to say. That was that, the wrong yeah. thing to say. But 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 to me, it was the best thing she could have said to me. Right. Because that knowing, was... that, knowing that you doubt me is going to make me work even harder. So I exactly. get out and I had a partner there. I partnered up with a friend of mine I went to law school with. And man, we hit the ground mm -hmm. running. And we made more money than I'd ever fathom making in my life in the first couple of years we were together. Now, I don't know where it went because... This is a discussion for another day, but right. making money and keeping money, two totally different things when you're in business. Trust me. I so, like I said, I made some mistakes, and your Uncle Sam and your Aunt Iris made sure that they didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> they got their portion. <laughs> they got their portion, but I learned. I learned a lot about business and partnerships because when that mm -hmm. partnership ended, there were a lot of loose ends that had to be tied up. And there was a lot of money that involved in that process. So one thing I learned also was that never start a business without an exit plan. Right. Never start a partnership without a partnership agreement and an operating agreement. Right. Never start a business without making sure that the exit strategy you have prepares for every contingency and every bill that needs to be paid. Right. So along the way, everything that I'm going through, everything that I've, I've dealt with, I'm learning from and I share it. Just like we're sitting here sharing now, I start sharing it. And, time, you know, as time goes on, it, it becomes easier and easier to actually do the work. But it, it's like it grew. My practice grew so fast. It was making my head spin and was demanding more and more of my time. There's that word we talk about time because I'm working one to one, one to one, one to one. And then I, I think I shared this with you, you know, it's been what almost 10 years ago now. I think it's been my mother come to me one day and she told me it was time to shut it down, to literally right. walk away from the law practice. And I was like, mom, what, you, what are you talking about? And um, 
she told me, son, I, you know, I watch you. She said, your family's worried about you. My, my granddaughter tells me how hard you're working and how worried everybody is about you and how you don't take care of yourself. How no matter where you go, people are pulling at you and you can't say no. And it's affecting your health. My blood pressure was extremely high. I gained a lot of weight. I'm still fighting to get the weight off. I've got blood pressure under control. I'm still fighting to get the weight off and stuff. And um, I thought my mom was just waxing philosophical. I'm her oldest son. You know, I've done well and she's proud of me. And mm -hmm. I never forget, I told her, mom, I'm not interested in being a judge or a DA or anything like that. At this point, I don't settle in. This is life. This is what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. And um, I never forget what she told me. She said, son, God's got bigger plans for you than you have for yourself. And so don't get too comfortable where you are. It's time for you to move. And I kind of ignored her, to be honest, Vince, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed about saying this because I, I kind of put off and I was like, all right, mama, you know, I'm getting ready. At this, at this point, you know, my business is really growing. And I bought, a, bought my building, bought, bought, my home, bought my home. You know, it's not a, I don't live in a mansion, but compared to where I grew up, the places I stayed, Whoa. this is a palace. You know, that's what I tell anybody, it's a palace. And right. so, um, you know, I'm on the golf course and the lake and all that stuff. So I'm like, Mama, when you come by, we're going to sit down and we'll talk about it. We'll drink a couple of Bacardis because she loved, loved her Bacardi silver. And we'll talk about it. And so for two weeks, you know, I'm running around like a chicken with, my, chicken with his head cut off, trying to get everything in place and get moved in the house, running my practice and never taking a break, never taking a minute to really stop and let stuff sink in. And um, I'll never forget the day we moved in when the last mover left. I sit down, I've got a you know seat in my, my living room. It's like a recliner. And I mm. sit back in that seat and the phone rang. And uh, my sister called me and I thought she and my mother were at the gate. And she told me my mom, um, had, they thought she was having a stroke and they were on the way to the hospital. And to be honest, in that two week time, there's so many times, man, I go through in my mind, I could have had that conversation with my mother, what, what I could have had. I didn't take the time to stop. No. I was so focused on, yeah, I was so focused on all this other stuff. So even though I had my own business, that business was treating me like a, like, a, you know, I, I allowed that business to take over my life. Like it was, like it was my job. Like it was everything. Yeah. What, what mama saw was that I wasn't happy that I was overexerting myself. I was giving too much of myself in it. And um, that's what led to the coaching and consulting and the other side of things, because it, really when I, you know, that day is one of the hardest days of my life because I, I literally went from, okay, we're moving in the dream home and I'm living the dream right. mama to, Hey mama, here, I'm your oldest son is here. Looking at my mama, her eyes are open, but she's not there. She's on a machine and whispering in her ear, Hey, it's okay. You go ahead and be with the Lord because we're going to be okay. Yeah. And thinking about this you know, stuff, man. It's hard. And, and you know, yeah. you, you, you're right. We get to a point especially when we get engulfed in it because it's, um, it, you're living the dream. Um, so we get to chasing more than we get to um, yeah. enjoying, right? Mm -hmm. The fruits of the labor is really, and, and like you said, it's the time. You run, you run around so much, spend so much time running around that the whole idea of it, the whole motive was to spend more time with the family, but you get engulfed in, because you're successful. And success brings a certain level of um, expectation. And you always want to get more, right? You, that's yep. another thing. Like you're never satisfied with what we have. We always want more. So we keep chasing something that's not really a real thing. That's not. And for me, Vince, and, you know, to, if, to be totally transparent about it, I was running more so than chasing. I was running from. I was running from that bucket. I was running from the outhouse. Right. I right. could never, and even to this day, it's hard for me. I can never have enough money in my mind because I know what it feels like not to have enough. And that's, it's a mental thing that I'm fighting. But, even but to know, this that's day. the real definition of never forgetting where you come from. See, when people say that, you can never forget where you come from when you come from certain situations because I'm not trying to go back. No, so I'm, I definitely know yeah. where I come from. People, right. when, when people talk about their nightmares, you know, some people run from the boogeyman. I'm running from an outhouse, bro. Right. I'm running from right. rats, roaches, crackheads. That's what I'm running from every night. Some nights I jump up in the middle of my sleep because I, you know, I, I dream that I'm back there. And that's yeah. that fear. I never wanted my family to have to, you know, deal with any of that stuff or even know anything like that. And that's important. And you've done a great job 
making sure they, they're not aware of that lifestyle at all. They, I've seen your house. I've been there a few times. They, yeah. They're not worried about it. These it's, are the boats in the back, or but we, that's something different. We're talking about that. <laughs> with, with my, we're blessed, man. But I, you know, my kids, man, they're all smarter than me. They were smarter than me the day they were born, and it's it's different for them because they say it's funny. It's funny because I laugh because I'm always trying to push them into starting start your own business, and, and like my daughter, she started a photography business, and everybody's got something that they do, and it's funny yeah. because like my my son Khalil, my middle son, he he got a job at pizza i'm like dude you ain't gotta do that you can work in my business from home like dad i'm gonna get the job they want to get out and experience stuff for themselves right. i don't want to i don't want them to do try to talk my daughter into working from home in my law office and she was like nah i'd rather go to the office dad i, I can't sit in the house and work i'm like dude i don't want to leave the house yeah. i work more i work more from home i work at home more than i work in my office i go yeah. to court and I come home and I do everything remotely that I can because I enjoy the atmosphere of being, being in my surroundings, being away, you know, being away but from all of that. But you know what, too, Tom? You, you, you're scaling back. So the last two years, we've talked about this numerous times. You, yeah. We're scaling back and we, we're looking for, we're both on our exit plan out of business things. So, But I'm going to just share with you. Uh, my son, he had told me, um, I think last week, whatever, Not there. week before last, yeah, he told That's me. Uh, man. He t he asked me, "Could he said, Dad, can I get a job?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wish I could have you seen know. your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was, you know, I really was like, okay, you know, that's what you want to do, but you don't have to, you know. I'm really, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really adamant with him on entrepreneurship. He said, like, "I just want to work so I can quit." I said, "That's a, that's my right, man. that's right, son." <laughs> my said, man. He said, "I'm gonna have my own business, but I want to work a job just to see what it is, and I'm gonna quit." I said, hey, that's, that's what you want to do. That's, you know, you're taking a job from somebody else, but that's neither here nor there. But I think now that we are, oh, you know, man. which we move a little forward, because you, I know I know personally that we're both working on an exit strategy as mm. far as positioning ourselves, not to not work, but to ownership and things of that nature. But before we get to that, mm. I want to know when you first start, and I know you say you started the, your, 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 your um, when you when you started the your your uh, law practice second time, it took mm -hmm. off. So you, and you kind of went. It wasn't no this. You went this, right? Straight up, yeah. When you start really seeing that money, you know, and, and we know when you like, okay, this <laughs> yeah. is different, right? You know, you get yeah. to like, well, this is way different. Like, like you you see you starting to see more money than you really can imagine spending at one time, right? How was that, and how did that change the the mind process? Because it comes with entrepreneurship. If you're successful, right? How does it? How did you balance that out? Because I know for me, it was it wasn't hard to balance. Because honestly, I would just you know I just stockpile until how I knew what I had was one day I went and said, "Oh, hold on, I I, I did all right." But before <laughs> then, I still would just you know my sixty forty plan. How how did what was your for us, and like I said, it's different phases. You know, well, you said the second time when I started, but so this yeah. is after me and my partner dissolved, because yeah. at that point, I went all the way back to, to zero. Flat like you took everything we had, dissolve that partnership, pay off all the bills and all that stuff, pay off the staff, because we had two no, no. offices. You know, now no, I'm, I'm starting about, over. No, that's you the, the first time. Because the first time you did eight months by yourself. Oh, that first, oh so the second then, time. So, the second time. Right. So the second time. Man, that was funny because we had an office in Warrington. Right. And we were working out of that office. And I, I told him, I said, I'm going to lease space in Lewisburg. And right. so we leased the space. It was an open space. And we start building up. We didn't even have ceilings in there yet. We just had walls yeah. up. Right. And I'm in there one day. And, and court's going on in Warren County on Wednesdays. And I'm in there like Wednesday morning. And people line up at the door when I get there. I'm going in there just to check, see if they come and turn the phones and lights and stuff on. They got them on. And a guy comes in and, you know, I got this case, $1,000. So I'm getting ready to go, get ready to lock up and go. Somebody else comes, $1,000. Somebody else comes, $1,000. Next thing I know, man, I made like seven, dollars $8,000 within like- In a day. Years. No, this is like in the first three hours. Right. So I called my partner, I'm like, look, dude, I ain't coming back to Warren County. People coming <laughs> here bringing money, I'm staying right here. Right. You handle Warren, I got this. And within two weeks, I was getting calls from him like, TC, what the hell are you doing down there? 
He said, man, I looked at the bank account and we went from here to here. Right. <laughs> Real big the, job. For me, it's kind of like I lock into it. I'm locked in. Okay, if this is what we're doing, we got to, I'm like, yeah, I got to stack it and I got to stack it. I got to right. stack it and I got to stack it. Now, mind you, we're, you know, I don't even think we had hit 30 yet. We're getting close to 30 at that point. And so you're, t you're talking to a, a poor country boy. He never seen right. money like that. I, di I didn't understand money, how money actually flows. Right. For anybody out there, you know, for, for the listeners out there, look, one thing I did learn, you better have a plan for your money because if you don't, everybody else does. Okay. You better believe it. Money flows. Whether it's out of your hand, out of your pocket, yeah. to somebody else's or into yours, it's going to flow. So make sure that you understand where to put the money. We were dealing a lot in cash back then. We didn't have right. a credit card machine at that point. People <laughs> just bring in cash and checks and we cash. Right. Them. And so I think we had an operating account, but you need an operating account, a payroll account. You need a sweep account. You yeah. need a, a, a savings account, a money market or savings or something for your business. You need different accounts to put your money, a tax account where you push the money in for your taxes because when you're in business for yourself, you're expected to keep up with your own tax taxes exactly. along the way. We made the quintessential mistake of waiting to the end of the year to think about taxes. And trust me, when we looked at the end of the year at what we made versus what we had, I, mean, I shook my head, I ain't no way in the hell we made that much money. <laughs> oh yeah, but the, you know, the accountant's like, you yeah, mean, you made that money. Right, but it went well, out. But it went out. And so that, you know, started a process too, where I started learning, you know what, somebody's got to watch this money. And so that became my, I was like a watchdog on every day I'm looking at the money, I'm watching it go out and I would get nervous. It's like yeah. all of a sudden I'm, I'm watching the phone the phone didn't ring, I get nervous. Cause I'm like, man, I gotta, you know, get it in, get it going. But to watch it come in like that. I had a friend of mine say this one, one time, he said, man, I like it when the money come in in big chunks. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with well, that. I, 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 don't, I don't know nothing about that. I haven't got no big chunks. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. oh, yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. I've been to your <laughs> house. I've seen, I've seen the many cars that you drive. I know okay. I've been with, I know because we have mutual clients. And yeah, when they uh, tell me, look, I'm going to have to pay you later because I got to pay Mr. M Mr. Higgs first because he can keep me out of jail right now. <laughs> so I know. I but, the big club coming in, but, but the big chunks, man. I like it when it comes in the big chunks. And when you, you're used to not having it, that, you know, it does something to you, man. It's like, a, you know, it, it, it wakes something up inside of you. So like you say, you really start chasing it too. And I did. I couldn't turn people away. I'd take anything. If, if you brought the money, I was going to take it. Because I thought, you know, volume, volume, volume. Well, the problem is when you're trading dollars for hours and individual services to people where it requires your time there are only 24 hours in a day i've got a wife i've got kids right. i've got other responsibilities but i'm now allowing my business to creep into those areas i think yeah. I, I think the worst point in my life really when i look at it this is when i re when i realized i'd become a human doing instead of a human being i brought mm. the new year in one year with a client that i really couldn't stand <laughs> at the magistrate's office and it started yeah. off with he called me around seven eight o'clock and i told him no man i really need your help and the, he kept going up by a thousand dollars every time i said no until he hit the magic number for me then and that was all you and i got up and i went up, i left my family like, daddy will be back left my family didn't know it was going to take as long as it did got paid <laughs> got the money can never go back and get that day back again now my kids are grown you know they don't I'm lucky if they spend a few minutes with me now because they got lives of their own. They're yeah, pretty much right. grown for the most part. That was a magical moment that I miss because I'm out here chasing something that if you're smart, you don't even have to chase it. When you realize it, it, it flows and you can control the flow. Right. And that's, that's the one thing that I, came later. Yeah. But that's one thing I appreciate about you and I respect about you is that you're very conservative when it comes down to your money. You're not, uh, you don't just blow money like a lot of people do. Which is great. Not now, anyway. You have, but not now. Let's, let's move uh, on. Yeah. And I, I blew it, blew, but again, blew it in business. And that was the thing about yeah. it, too, because I, will, I do want to say this put a pin in this. If you're in business for yourself and you're stockpiling money in your operating account, you're losing because piling can, and see that I thought that was the win was to stockpile the money. Right. But the problem is the more you stockpile, the more the you're more going to be gold. taxed on. Yep. Yeah. And that's, and, and, and that's something that we, we had to learn. I, I think we both learned that the hard way. 
Yeah. Um, but you know what, too? Um, I just had a point. Um, you are... You, you, you're one of the people that you, like I said, the last couple of years, you've been really planning out your, your exit strategy from the law, which is, you know how I feel about it. It's bizarre to me because I think, <laughs> I mean, we and you have had many a conversation where I think you can monetize it. And I, and I know you will. I know you will. You say it, but I know you're going to figure out the way to, well, I, I know you already know the way to monetize. I think you just, you have personal reasons with the law where you're just like, I'm tired of dealing with this nonsense. But you found something that was more that I know excites you, right? Um, and you and I know you're gonna be I know you're gonna be successful in this field. Um, I have no doubt about that. I know the work you're putting in, and I know what's coming. And, and I appreciate and, that, bro. And, and I know it's gonna be big. And it's gonna it's gonna be shocking, though. It's gonna be shocking to a lot of people. Because, it, because and the reason why I say that is because it's so far away from what you, but, what you do now. You know? But if you think about it, it's not because the whole thing with coaching and consulting is all along the way, I've always been that guy where I want everybody to win. I'm more of a team right. guy than a me guy. So for me, it was always about sharing what I knew anyway. The hardest part for me, believe it or not, was understanding that what I, the processes that I had learned and the experience, the knowledge that I'd gained mm -hmm. had value because I took it for granted that, hey, this is just stuff everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And I would just give it away. And I still do for, for, you know, for the most part, I give a lot of information away. And but I know. The, yeah, I know you I know because, I, because I know the people, I know some of the people you mentor. I know some mm -hmm. of the phone calls you get. I, and I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about for the last five years. Six years. I know what information you have divulged and who you helped, whether they say it or not. I know because I've been there and I know what's, you know, we've been yeah. around the same people. So, so that's what I'm saying. I know you're going to be successful because now you're monetizing it to make money off it. And mm -hmm. that was, but, but Vince, that was the hardest part for me because right, I was I know. So, yeah, I was so reluctant about that part of it. But then, and when mama died, really having to sit down and Man, I, I lost two months of my life when she passed away. It's two months. Now, I really what happened. And yeah. I started to think about the things that she had said, because the day she died, my, one of my younger brothers was with her. And he told me, it's Tom, mom died in the chair. She slid down in the chair. He said, when I went to grab her, she looked up at me and she said, tell my children I love them. And that thing hit me because I had had her at that point, I think for about 36 years. My brother, Chris, who was with her at that point in his life may have been 18, 19. So he had my baby sister was probably 12. Right. And so they hadn't had the time I'd had with her. And I know it didn't feel like I'd had enough time with her. And I just kept thinking about that thing. You know, her last moment on this earth, she took the, the last breath she had. She took it to, to make sure that we knew that she loved us and that everything was OK. And I was, Tom, if you were in that situation, I had to be honest with myself, what would you say? I'd be saying, Lord, please give me more time because I haven't done enough to show my children right. I love them. I can't compare to what she did. I, you know, I try, I, I hope that I'm a good father. I pray that I am. I'm you not perfect. Are. I try my you best, are. but look, well, you, you know. Let me tell you, you definitely agree. Well, I appreciate that because that was always one of the things I wanted to be, but chasing that you know chasing that dollar a lot of times i let it creep into too much of my family life i let it take up right. too much of my time so when we talk about me transitioning away that was part of it too because in my law practice i can serve i service people one to one one to one and it, it demands so much of my time yeah. but with coaching and consulting because <clears throat> excuse me i'm able to do it online i can serve one to many now the other part of it is because you know this too even more than a lot, I, I went I, I went into practicing law as a service because of an injustice and one to right. right the wrong. And I dedicated myself to doing that, but it took a huge toll and it still takes a toll on me to be in the courtroom and to deal with that side of things because in practicing criminal law, it's, it's never about anything good. There's some good right. times, some good things you can do to help people, but it's normally people are coming to you with a serious problem and you've got right. to take it on. In coaching and consulting, because I'm a business coach, I, I get to talk about entrepreneurship and business, something that I can talk about all day long. I've, I've been on here with you, what, about, probably about an hour, hour and a half, just running my, bumping my yeah. gum, because I love it. I absolutely love it. I get excited when somebody 
takes the talent that they have and they turn it into a business and they win, they get that first dream client or dream customer that right. they want. Or the first time they make their own money. I never forget the, I still have a picture of it. The first day my daughter went out and she, you know, had her first client and she come home and she's got the cash in hand mm -hmm. and I took a picture of it and I'm right. taking the picture and I'm crying. There are tears in my eyes. And I, the one question I could think to ask her was, how does it feel? How does it feel to make your own money? She said, it feels good. And it was just something in my heart, man. My heart just flooded. Like, I'm going back to the first time somebody, first time I made a hundred dollars on my own. That's right. First time I made seven hundred dollars on my own. A thousand dollars, ten thousand. Right. It's like I'm, my heart's fluttering, and I'm like, oh my god, that feeling. It's just something about that. So it's and to about pass it off to someone else is definitely bingo. a blessing, right? Bingo. It's a blessing to help somebody else. We you know, we um we 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 get to we get to we're in a unique position because we get to do things like this and motivate other people, hopefully when they see it in some way. And, and you know me, I'm not really a, uh, I'm, I don't like cameras and I don't, I don't really do this. But I think it's, it's, amazing, it's amazing to see you on this camera because I know you, Listen, do, you do not do this. You no, know, I don't like this. I don't even like to be seen. I, I'd rather just be, you know my motto, don't, you don't got to see me, just remember me. But I think it's imperative for, for my son and his, his cousin, my niece, because they're starting, they, you know, they started their own business. They semi-successful. And I'm big ups to the big ups to them too. They're, they're really yeah. successful early. I appreciate it. And I want them to be, you know, continue to be young entrepreneurs, but I don't want to just, it's easy for me to let them see it from, let them see it from me or mm -hmm. from, you know, you know, it's, that's easy. But my plan is let me, let, let me, like he called it, let's, let's go look at uncle Tom. Let's see what he, cause Tom has got his own, Law practice, he doing his internet thing. You know, he got a bunch of things going on. You know, I mean, and, let, me, let me say this: you got to edit the cussing out there because I don't, I don't want them to know that Uncle Thomas be cussing. Oh, no. Listen, you know who they father is. You know, <laughs> you know, he, you know, he know every word. He know not to say it, but he know every word. But, but I, I want them to see that it, that is not a fluke. You know, I didn't just yeah. get lucky. Like You're not this an could anomaly. be done. That's right. Right. This could be done. Like you know, he. I mean, that's the that's the image, and not just my son, but all you, because. Mm -hmm. Is as what somebody have to combat the whole go get a good job. What about teaching these kids to dream? Exactly. I mean, have your know, own voice. The whole thing, you know, the whole thing for me, and, and I'm not anti education, but education is changing right now. We have access, we have information overload. There's more right. information out there than ever. Entrepreneurship is about implementation. It's about problem solving. It's one of the best skills, you know, one, one of the best skills that you can take on is to become an entrepreneur because right. you become responsible for problems you didn't create. That's right. And sometimes it's a matter of you connecting people with solutions to a problem. Networking. Networking. So there's so many aspects that, and that, that's why I get excited about it. The other thing for me is, I think it's one of the pillars of advancement. If you want to advance as a community, as a people, then you have to be economically viable. And the only way to do that is to create it for yourself. It's not going to come by subsidies or anything else. It doesn't right. work that way. Yeah, you know, there are grants and handouts that people get, but guess what? The people that get most of that money have businesses. The perks okay. are for businesses. When, when, when the pandemic hit and the government starts shelling out money and stuff like that, I told somebody it, it I talk with my, you know, with my accountant, my financial advisor, and first thing he told me is, well, you know, you qualify for unemployment. I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're an escort. You're on payroll in your own business. That's why we set you up that way. When the time comes, if you need to do that, you can do that. I gave myself options that most people right. didn't have. Now, am I bragging, bragging about? No, it's, it's not about bragging. It's about understanding. All right, if it works this way, then I want all my people to know about this. That's I don't, right. you know, if you got a job, that's great. Start a business at home on the side because it's going right. to give you more, more opportunities, more advantages. Choice. I, I don't tell people to go quit their job today. I did that. You know, what, Hove did that, so you don't have to do that. I, I yeah. did that, yeah. right. but you don't have to do that. Build your business alongside your job. If you're going to give the job eight hours a day, give your business at least two. Right do that and you build it over time that way when the day comes because the day will come when the job is either going to be taken away huh. or it's going to huh. end well. you control the narrative you're not standing there saying what's going to happen to me because you already have plan b that's right that's when your plan b becomes plan a and that's you know that's my motto my plan b has always been Make sure plan A don't fail. <laughs> Make sure plan A doesn't <laughs> fail. That's right. As long as plan A don't fail, you're all right. Your plan B works smooth. Um, 
so now we into um your new venture mm -hmm. um which I, I like i yeah, you know, I'm a little old school still, so I, I, you know, but I do like it. And I know, I know where you're going with this, and I know you're gonna, you know, I, I, I back you 100 percent in it. Yeah, you always um, support me, bro. I appreciate yeah, that because uh, not I, a lot no, of people do. <laughs> nah, no problem. I know, I see the vision, and I know where you're going with it. And I know what's about to happen, uh -oh. um, and I want to see you succeed. Like you know, I appreciate not, like I said, I might not be knowledgeable of it, but I need to see my brother succeed because if you don't. When you win, I win, and vice versa. If I win, you win. So. Hey, you're one of the most knowledgeable people I know because whenever I'm stuck, I, I sit down with you, and inevitably there's going to be a solution. It may not be what I want to hear, but it's what I need to hear. Mm -hmm. And those conversations for me, like we're sitting here now, I'm learning from you as, we, as we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so what's the saying is what iron sharpens iron. That's right. I do you want, want to you say want, that. You're one of the That's sharpest kids I know. <laughs> you know, point blank. We, 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 but, you watch. know, it goes both ways. Yeah, I watch you. Ways, I, and certain things, you know, you got, my weakness is your strength a lot of times. So and I know it's coming, hey, yeah. Tom, hey, what's this about? You Because I might not know, but we sit down, we'll figure it out. You definitely put me on to a lot of information um, or contacts. Hey, go call this person, see this person. So we just build with each other. And that's what brother's supposed to do. We're supposed that's to it, build that's it, exactly. because I can't, I'm no, I'm no, you know, I can't, I can't want it all by myself. It don't make sense for me to be, to have everything or want everything without my, fa without my family and my, my community around it. That's why, you know, I'm big on that. Let's build our own community within a community. That's how so, you, that's how you start. So I, I watch you do that because you invest in so many people. I've watched you invest yeah. in the youth. I've watched you start programs when nobody else was doing anything. But what really impressed me was that I watched you come in in different businesses and go from the ground up to dominating it. And not dominating in the sense of, hey, look at me, I'm dominating this because I've seen you. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not one to name names, but I remember when you decided to go into, you wanted to go into the bail bonding yeah. business. And I told you to go see somebody and they shocked me because they kind of tried to turn you away. And lo and behold, this day, you're on top of that game. This person's not in the game anymore. And I've watched you with other people bring them <laughs> in. You could have taken you know, that same stance. This is how they did me, but that's not how you roll. You're you like know, me. I'm, a, I'm trying to bring in as many people as I can. Right. I, you know, um, Ron, I did an interview with Ron. He brought the same situation. I didn't even know he knew. But the gentleman spoke, I guess, spoke to him about it or whatever the case may be. And I, like I told him, you know, I was already coming. You know, mm -hmm. I was coming. That I wasn't gonna be. That was no doubt. I was coming, but that just sparked another, a different type of fire. That that's made definitely. me say, "Not now. I'm not only coming. Now I'm coming to conquer." And that's you know, and that's just. But you know, that's well, see, it. Coming. taught me something too because I was. It was naive of me to think that everybody saw things the way that I saw them. Just because we're you know we're the same color, not every black business owner thinks that way. Some people really believe that I have to push my competition away. I'm, I'm more right. about, Hey, let me turn my competition into cash flow. Let's, right. how can I help? How can I help them? How can, you know, how right. can we align ourselves? So we both, you know, we eat, you and I talk about this a lot. We eat because there's right. enough, there's enough out. You can look at for me everybody. and I love to eat. There's plenty <laughs> for everybody. I haven't missed a meal because right. what comes from me comes from God, comes from God. What's for right. you comes from God. Right. <laughs> you know, he can, he can't run out. So why should I worry? Right. It's funny you say that because that's that's like the, the common thread is that um what comes what 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 what's for me is for me. When my phone rings, no one else can answer it, and vice versa. But yep. we um but I, and even like you said, you you brung uh, I'm not going that because you you have put some people in good positions that um but it's a blessing. Okay, let's just leave that. I'm gonna just leave it at that. I'm gonna skip on up past that. Um, yeah. What's some of the um, what's some of the things that you think you, you should you could have done different going into uh in the latter part of your career? What's some of the things you said? You know, I could have probably played that way a little differently. Um, because we all take losses, but you know, not even losses financially, but just time. Because that's you know that's what we really. Realistically, and that's one thing I'm 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 pushing on these this, these segments is money gonna come. Mm. 
but the time is what we really that that's to. the that's the biggest thing because i remember having mentors say to me when i first got started clifton slow down you know take a deep breath enjoy the process i could have enjoyed the process more okay. um the other thing was understanding how you know the seasons for everything when I started out, you know, I'm, I'm gung ho, I'm ready to go, I'm out here tearing it up, but I should have been able, I should have had enough foresight to see, you know what, there's going to come a day where you're going to run out of time to give, so you need to have a plan, how do you shift that? Now, don't get me wrong, I, I had visions of how to do stuff, I've had multiple partners, I've had associates that work for me, multiple offices, yeah. and I've had plenty of people to come and go, but it was always focused on continuing to build it to that next level. Me and you talk about this because you used to ask me about this all the time. Why not open up more offices and stuff like that? Right. And I, I'd always kind of go around, but I'd done that at one point. Right. And the biggest thing I realized was that I have to manage all of that. I still have to dedicate my time to it. And right. by that point, I'd already started to realize, you know what? I'm, I came in on something that, that's starting to change. So we talked about this before COVID hit. We were already in the mode, like you said, of transitioning to more... Yeah. Remote Two years. Work. Yeah, working. Two years. I spend more time working from home. I, I started changing the types of cases that I took. No more murder right. cases, no more rape cases, because right. I didn't like how I felt when I did those cases. I, I, I Thank God I could help the people that I helped. But the way it made me feel, the time I spent away from my family, the time it took me to recover from that, I knew it was, right. I had to be honest with myself. And, you know, it's not good for you. Right. Um, getting away from that stuff. And then the other thing was spending more time learning from other entrepreneurs, learning th yourself, mm -hmm. learning, you know, how, how to expand what I have, learning to appreciate what I have and understand mm -hmm. it for what the value that it, that it has. And that those are some of the things because I, I'd go through with the blinders. I, I really thought that, Hey, this is just stuff everybody knows. Right. No, if it's something about structuring a business or setting up the accounts or whatever the case, may be, this just stuff everybody knows. Yeah, and, and, and they don't. Um, most people don't know it, oddly enough. But again, I think that some of us are born with, it's just in our DNA. It's in our bone gristle that we're supposed to be this. Um, and a lot of it too is because we chose to not just dream, but to get up and chase our dream. Um, like, we all, like, even... My exit strategy is a little different because I'm I'm kind of shifting into more like you know things I told you about in private. Mm -hmm. like, I'm doing stuff like that, but no, that's my exit strategy. Like I'm just trying to uh, relieve a lot of stress and, and continue to be happy and things of that nature. Um, this year was hard. You know, it was hard for me. I lost a lot. I lost per yeah. in, in my personal life, not so much business because. Business always to me is like I said, it's always about time. Money I'm gonna get. Like I know how to make a dollar. As long as they print it, I can figure it out. But you start losing a lot of uh hair, let's say, stress, and you know, you get to a point where you like life is not as fun as it was. Mm -hmm. So that's what made me say, okay, I'm getting older, time for me to start transitioning. And in in the process of transitioning, I still want to educate others, not even just kids, but young adults and things of that nature that that working <clears throat> working for someone is not bad. I'm not gonna say it's bad. I don't like it, but it's not bad. But but just, you, you want to have a backup plan because this year this pandemic has taught us that yes. Why wait till everything hit the fan when you can actually be in front of the curve and say, hey, when it get bad, we okay. I'm I'm glad I'm glad you said that too because the shift was happening anyway, and people didn't get it. And now it's happening at, at such a rapid rate. It's, it's scary to see how the world is changing, the economy, education, right. the way we do business. It's all changing. And you can either sit back, worry, complain, and say, okay, I don't like this. Or like you say, you learn to ride that wave, try to get right. out in front of it and figure out what the advantages are. And the yeah. funny thing about it is, well, it's nothing funny about the pandemic, but the strange thing was we had already started doing that. Right. And to me, probably one of the best ways to do it, I, I laugh at you because you don't fancy yourself a coach or a consultant, but that's exactly what you are. Yeah, I hear it all the time, but well, I don't believe it. <laughs> well, you, you take it from me. I know one when I see one. That's yeah, exactly what I you are. It. What's a consultant? A consultant is someone who gives, you know, professional advice to right. a client or a customer to help them overcome obstacles. And that's what you do every single day. 
You help and people. You, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to let me let me retract my statement. I'm not going to say I'm not a consultant because that's the business I'm trying to go into. I'm, I don't feel like I'm a coach. And the reason why is because I think I think I just I think I'm just a good problem solver. Well, the thing about a coach is you solve problems personally, but what you also do, and I've watched you do this, is help other people connect the dots and encourage right. them to continue trying to connect them. That's all a coach yeah. is. Whether it's you know, whether it's in sports, physical fitness, yeah. and right. business. We just happen to we just happen to operate in the business realm. Business realm, yeah. And and the the beautiful thing about it is a lot of the life lessons that we've learned they translate mm. so well to the right. business world also, mm. and it's such a natural progression. You, you you're like me. You've been doing this your whole life, and that's yeah. what hit that's what hit me. I've been doing this. My, I've been mentoring, coaching, and consulting my whole life. I'm the oldest, right. you know, a bunch of kids. So I always had to do it anyway. I was forced to do it growing up. But then when I, you know, when I went to college, I took care of a bunch of guys in the dorm. I was forced to do it then. All the guys came to me for advice because, hey, Tom was straight arrow. He's going to shoot it to you straight. Then when I pledged my fraternity, I became, when I was online, I was the honcho. So I was the guy that everybody kind of came around. Mm -hmm. and, hey, And then I became the chapter president. It's kind of the same thing. So I'm like, wait a minute. It's natural. This is what I do. This is what I'm going to do. Monetize, and now you're monetizing it to, and, and to then your you next monetize. phase in life. That's exactly right. And, and that's, a, that's a blessing, man. It is because the thing about it is being able to work, go from one to one to one to many. The beautiful thing about the internet is they're what, at this point, I think they're like eight point, you know, 4.8 billion registered internet users in the world. Mm -hmm. Just like we're sitting here talking, you could have thousands of people on this call. And I, I, I predict that you will. One day. In the near future. God, God willing. Yeah, you will. Inshallah. And yeah. so... For them to be able to learn from you, they're going to be so grateful to be able to do that. And you teach all at once. So you don't have to go back and keep saying the same thing over and over again. Over and over. Right. The beauty of technology is you're recording this call. You can put it in a membership site. And instead of had, sitting here having to go through everything that we talked about in this, you could tell somebody, hey, go watch this video, then come back with right. your questions. And they're going to come back with more pointed questions. And most of the answers they're going to already know. So it makes the work, it makes your workload easier. So. Right, cool. That just totally fascinates me. Part of the reason why was because when I practiced law, I had to do it unconventionally. When I started, one of my mentors, you know, he had a, the back cover of the phone book. Right. People had law firms that were almost 100 years old that they were either born into or they had come into. I didn't have any of that. So I had to be unconventional and, and be innovative when it came to advertising and marketing. And in learning to do that, I, what I realized was that if you create a system that speaks directly to the people who need your services and you can mm -hmm. put together put together an offer that they can't refuse. Like the Godfather said, make them an offer they can't refuse. That's right. They're going to come. And when they do, you create a system. You take that system and it becomes automated. That's when the big chunks start coming in. And that's what I love. I love creating systems. I love watching the systems work. I love teaching people the systems and then seeing their eyes light up when they see it work because when you go from one at a time to 20, 30 hundreds. at a time, hundreds, yeah. thousands, and all of a sudden your phone, that little bell on your phone's going off every time money hits and it's hidden when you sleep, hidden when you, it's hidden when you sit on the toilet. Right. Life changes. That's good money. <laughs> See, I don't know that. I don't, life I don't know changes. that life yet. I don't know life that changes. yet. But I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Little, little taste of it, little taste, not a whole lot, little taste, just enough. <laughs> and the thing so about it, the, the, experience. Yeah, the money is the money is relative. The thing about it is when you start to realize, okay, it's there right. and it's going to be there and you start to move differently. The other thing is I'm 46 years old. My, my needs and my wants <laughs> have, have kind of merged and they're, right. they're all on the same line. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's all need. <laughs> Ain't no wants anymore. It's just needs. You and know, and that, that's, that's one thing I, I say about entrepreneurship and that I'm so impressed with when like when things like this unconventional things like a pandemic or something crazy like this happen. Oh, yeah. When we don't we don't we don't we don't I mean everybody I guess panic at first because we just don't know. Yeah. But you know financially you can okay, I can maintain my family. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna feel this. And you know that was, you know that's been my big thing. I don't want my kids to feel this. Yeah. And I, I felt like I was very prepared for that going into it. So I, I definitely appreciate that part of, that's one thing we've been building for the last five years. And we've been, like you said, still sharp and still, we've been on it. We've and making sure we, we get on our, our, you know, 
I had I'm no clue. Finished. Had no clue a pandemic was coming. Listen, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> didn't, didn't see this coming, but no. I think the last time we sat down at eight was in February. In February, it was. That, that's amazing. That it's still surreal to me, and I don't want to you know go too deep into that. But it was surreal to me when the realization hit. You know what? Courts getting ready to shut down. I'd never seen that happen right. before. Ever. That's when I knew. I knew we was in a. We was in a. Yeah, loaded trouble. Yeah, school shut down. Court shut down before school did. Yeah. <laughs> school shut down, and then you know, people's jobs closed down and stuff. And the hardest part was watching people receive the news that they didn't have a job anymore. Yeah, right. It's hard watching people with businesses and hearing them say, you know, my family had this business for years, and now it's going to have to close. And if you look at what's emerging, those businesses that can leverage the internet in some form or fashion, right. They're growing and thriving, but the basic brick and mortar, even when this thing ends, there's going to be a change in the order. And right. change, of, change of the guards. Yeah, changing on the guards. Yeah. So that's why I say, you know, it, it would behoove us to avail ourselves of every opportunity like you're doing now. This is a skill yeah. set to be able to get on this wow. medium, do interviews. Different. And it's different. And like you said, you, this is not you. This is not it's what not. you normally do. Now you look natural doing it. It's, you're a natural <laughs> at it, not. but it's not you. Like you said, but you stepped out of your comfort zone. You didn't have to do that. You, you got you got enough money. You got to come out your comfort zone. Listen, you can no, no. you can roll around in your cash, Vince. Listen, I ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, me nobody no listen to him. Listen, tell me, tell me no lies. I know. <laughs> but the fact of the matter like you is, said. you um, yeah. I, 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 I mean to cut you off, but the fact of the matter is, you did it. You stepped out of your comfort zone, and because of that, yeah. somebody's going to benefit from it. There's and that's one thing I had to do. Um, I felt necess necessary was, and I think it was it was because you had been told me about like you need to do this. I'm like, eh, I'm I'm uncomfortable, but I, I know I have so much time now, and I can't do what I've been doing. Now I do have a couple of, um, well, I just can't do what I've been doing. So I had to find other streams of income, and that, not that I want to do this for me because I'm I'm pretty okay. I, I live a simple life, but I think it's just so important to teach other people. Why not now when everybody's home on the internet, why not put something in front of them that's going to build them up opposed to everything that just tears them down? Exactly. You know, We spend so much time on, on the internet anyway, on social media. Right. And why not learn how to make money while you're up there on it? It, right. it just, it makes sense to me. So yeah, I, I was encouraging you because I could see it. There's so many avenues and it's the same that. thing that you've been doing anyway. You're bringing the same value. You're just now able to reach more people right. simultaneously. And that makes yeah. a big difference. And the other thing, like you said, teaching the skill set. If you yeah. can master this, then you can teach other people how to do it, which means that future generations, because it's not going away. The yeah, biggest, no. you know, yeah. the biggest company in the world at this point is Amazon doing yeah. more business than anybody else. They're not going Dude. anywhere. Right. Don't own no product. No, no, probably it's, it's an internet company. Jeff Bezos is an internet marketer. <laughs> so people right. still are. That's not real business. The man worth like $200 billion and you still say that's not real business? I don't, th I don't think he get no realer than that. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. In the next five years, where do you see yourself at? Right right here at the crib, to be honest, working, working from this office. Um, I still have my law practice. I want to keep it open for some minimal yeah, stuff that I do. And, you know, just for the camaraderie, because I still have a few friends that are in it. And I love, <laughs> I love mentoring to new lawyers too. That's one thing that I did mm -hmm. find. I have, I have a passion for doing that. I right. keep my skills set up. So I'll still be doing a little bit of that, but I'll mm -hmm. be doing more of this, more, more coaching, more consulting, more fishing, home, more, more fishing. Yeah. Um, let's see, five years, Elijah will be 19. So he's grown at that point. So maybe me and Frida can f finally retire to the Caribbean. I'll be, be able to work from there. <laughs> <laughs> Real probably retired, retired to the, from the Caribbean. I'll be right here. I'll be, yeah. Look, I was going with you till you said the Caribbean. I said that's not gonna happen. I know that. <laughs> no, nah, I get, I get bored. I know me. I'm gonna have to be home. Yeah. But yeah. now, nah, working from the house, spending time with family, man, that's what I look forward to. The, the upside of the pandemic is I enjoy having my family around. My wife, my kids, and you know, I enjoy right. them. Them being here. A lot of times, you know, they'll be in the other room or whatnot. It's just I know they're safe. I know where they are. So that's been cool Nothing watching more them. Than that. I think it's hitting them harder than it's hitting me because I'm just, I guess I'm a homebody. I'm, I'm introverted. I'm a homebody. So 
Well, you've been out so long, you've been running so hard, so much that now you get a chance to sit down. It's different. Yeah, like, it's you different. know, that's me too. Like, I tell you, I get up some days in honest suit and they sit there for two days. I don't go out. I, <laughs> I, just, I put it on when I go out. If if I can avoid putting a suit on, I will not put that son of a gun on at all. Yeah. I I went for a whole month not wearing a suit, and I was enjoying it. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I'm telling you, sometimes I sit there and just be sitting in the closet. I mean, you know, I, I iron it, and I hang it up, and they just sit there. And I was like, man, I ain't going nowhere today. It don't make sense to put it on. Suit, but, the big, The funniest thing for me is like getting up, going to the office because people are like, man, you got that whole building. I'm like, yeah, but I'm there and it just doesn't do it for me. But then I come here and I get in this office and I'm relaxed and, and the creativity work. comes. Yeah, even yeah. for my law practice, I come here and I you know, do most of my consultations from the house in my law practice. Right. And I'm more relaxed. My clients will say, you know, you sound like you're a lot happier. You know, I see you at, in court sometimes, you always look so stern, but then when I talk to you on the phone, you seem so happy. I'm like, yeah, I'm at the house. I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. You're in that it's, big old house. All that land, I ain't talking about how big your house is. It's it's okay. It's not it's not a mansion. I don't I don't live in a mansion, either, but compared to where I come from, it's a palace, is what I tell people. And I'm so. thankful for that. I think people have the wrong impression of what a mansion is. So mm. I'm just gonna leave it there. I, I know what you got. So, well, but let's be modest. Let's be modest. Well, not 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 even about that. It's just I'm blessed. I'm th I'm thankful. You definitely that. Um, definitely, definitely thankful. And I remember I've been to you. I've been to your place too. So yeah. listen, don't do that. Now, look, this is about you. Don't, don't, road in, do road in many of your cars. <laughs> not that. just I just drive old pickup truck. You drive luxury listen. cars. Listen, that, listen. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> hey man, let's hey, just you. move on. Hey man, you look go down that path, but now um, for me, it, it, it's just one of those things, man. I enjoy this part of it, but and and watching this grow, building, like you said, the building phase of it, building this part of the business too, building, you know, the mm -hmm. coaching and consulting, watching mm -hmm. other people build their businesses. I look forward to the day when I've got multiple clients that are multimillionaires that I can go and interview them and and sit down with them and just enjoy the fruits of their labor and just being around it. I look at, you know, I look at like my, my former law partner and mentee, you know, Adam, Judge Keith. And people ask me sometimes, man, he's a judge. When are you going to become us? Now, that's not for me. That's for him. Right. He always wanted to be one and he's perfect in it. It's, it's, right. I get so happy and people say, well, you know, you had a lot to do with us. No, I had very little to do with it. I'm just thankful I was in place to help him at the time that I could. And I was in position to help him get to the place he needed to be. Right. And it makes me happy to see him in his, you know, as they say, in his crown and achievement. That's where he's supposed to be. But for me on this side of it, ease on out the side door. Let's go do a little fish. Maybe yeah. get, a, get a couple of cigars, you know, that type that's of thing. Not, you know, that's exactly. Thing. Yeah, that's that's and, and it's the exit control. strategy. And yeah. you know what? It's, it's good to see another brother have an exit, exit strategy because we live, we live a life, most people live a life where they don't have an exit strategy. That's you know, true. we come from a we come from an environment um, where people retire and they go work at Walmart. Either that or they die working. Right. And that's well looking that's back on it for me, and that's that's kind of the way that I was raised. That you know, it's a lot of times for people in my family, they don't get the stuff that I say. That's why I love hanging out with you because you get it. Retiring doesn't mean that I don't work, it means I get to dictate how, when what you do and what I do. Right how much I work, when I work, where I work. Even going to court, people tell me, well, you own your own law practice, man. How much more freedom do you want? I said, look, somebody else still control when I can go to the bathroom, when I can take a lunch break. That's right. too much power. That's too much right. power for me to give away. Yeah. That ain't, that ain't nobody supposed to have that power with me except for my wife at this point. That's right. God, That's Jesus right. Christ, and Frida Clifton, don't you be the only people I have to answer to. In that order. In that order. In that order. And I, right. right now, I still got judges I got to deal with and all this stuff, too. And I'm like, some yeah. days, most days yeah. I can handle it. But then some days, man, I'm sitting there and I'm itching. I'm like, you know what? This is taking too long. I don't want to be here. Yeah. I'm ready to go. I, not that I have anywhere to go that I to have go. anything. But, but I don't, but I don't want to be here. Do I want to go. Right. You know, I don't and that's a blessing of being that, you know, that's a blessing of being entrepreneurs because you can you can shift. you really do have the opportunity to say eh, I don't want to do this right now yeah. I don't and you know that's my biggest thing I don't like to be on nobody's time no, like, I don't want 
I'm still holding out hope that maybe one of my children or my nep niece or nephew will become a lawyer. And I said, well, I do need to hang around long enough to see. I've got one nephew that's expressed an interest in going to law school, although he probably won't come back this way. Uh, my kids, I think all of them have it in them, but they, they don't I think that's the last thing they'll want to do. <laughs> they, they they never do. Want to do but just in case, I'm going to hold on a little while long and, you know, try to keep it, keep the door open. But outside of that, I said, well, if somebody want an opportunity, they can come through and buy it. And I could still maintain my license from the house and, and everything yeah. would be fine. But I'm like you, exit strategy. I didn't grow up. I never heard anybody with an exit strategy when I was growing right. up. And then the first time I saw somebody that really took that route and said, you know what, I'm out. And I, I'm looking at them living their life and how extremely happy they are. And mm -hmm. understanding that like working for 40 years and then retiring in your old age, like I said, going to work at Walmart, if that's what you want to do, that's great. I'm not knocking anybody. And sometimes people do what they have to do. Right. For the people that I see that are living life on their terms, that's where I want to be. And I don't want to wait until I'm 65. As a matter of fact, I feel like I'm behind now. I should have, I should have been out at 35. Right. Now I'm 46, going, you know, 46, soon to be 47. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of not desperation, but inspiration pushing me to, hey, go hard, man, at this thing and do it. It's, it, you know, it's worthwhile. Man, I, I know for a fact you're going to be successful. You pretty much, everything I know you touch, you're successful. And so I have no doubts that that's going to be your next phase in life. I think that's, and, and then you're just going to own a business and that's going to be your exit strategy. And I, and I, and it's something that you love to do. It's intriguing to you. So I know you do very well at it. You know, I'm always here to help. I'm pretty sure we'll be linking up on some business. Soon. Oh, you know, so, um, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't even, that, I'm not even questioning that. I know where you're going with that. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me interview you. I know it was a little awkward because I'm- No, that's my pleasure, man. I was interviewing. Uh, things of that nature. I, I got to come to your platform. And, and, and oh, I do. Yeah. Now that, that, that I've done that, you have no choice now. You can't avoid me anymore. You yeah, got to come. I definitely, on. listen, I got to come do it. Uh, you know, the camera thing is still a little new to me. Well, see, mine is audio, so yeah, I ain't even, you know, you yeah, I, I, oh, did, really? I, did, I did put a shirt on with a collar on for you. Otherwise, I would have been in a t shirt, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, I, yeah my, <laughs> my podcast is audio. Look, they've been trying to get me to do okay, video. I, got, I ain't doing it. You don't want to do it. No, nah, I want to put clothes you on. Know what? I, I, I want to put clothes and lotion on. Yeah, yeah listen. Listen, I, I was told I need to put some. But then anyway, <laughs> I was, um. I, I, but once we finish with this, I do know a, a new platform that just started that's an audio driven platform. We'll talk about it. I'll get that information to you. Okay. So you were probably looking to put it there. You know, that's, do, um, do it with this. it's more for Man. entrepreneurship. Well, this right here. Now you know that you can separate the audio from the video, so that yeah. you can put it on. Yeah, I know. Forms. Yeah, so yeah, so I mean, like, that's so how I know about the other thing because yeah, we'll wrap off camera. Yeah. You can't give it all away yeah, yeah. in one shot. <laughs> well, Tom, tell yeah. everybody how to um how to get in contact with your social media and all that, and um oh man, it's it, it, the it's law pretty, firm. It's pretty let's easy. Let's it's the law firm. Law firm. You go to cliftonlawoffice.com. It's the law office Thomas H. Clifton, and you can find me at cliftonlawoffice.com. And then, um, I'm not sure I put my number out there for Thomas H. Clifton LLC. It's 919-436-1100. Uh, you can call me. I'm one of those type of people. I am accessible. Okay. You can call me. It's okay. And um, I'll get you the link for the coaching and consulting and stuff, too, to make sure that you have that. I just can't remember it right now. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Okay. What's the what's the name of it? And and your Facebook. I know you have it on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Um, The Business Branding the Blueprint. Blueprint. <laughs> business Branding yeah. Blueprint. And, um... If you go on Facebook, businessbrandandblueprint.com, you can actually join my group. Uh, I've got a right. free Facebook group that I'm inviting people to join for that. And um, free, uh, and then livefreeacademy.com is where I host my podcast. Live Free Academy. Mm -hmm. Right. You'll find me there. I'm so not hard to find. Go, go follow them on Business Branding Blueprint. Blueprint, Blueprint. on mm -hmm. Facebook.com. Mm -hmm. And um, the podcast, Live Free what is it? Die, live, live free or die grinding. Mm -hmm. Live free or die grinding. Die com, okay. yep. You'll love that because there's a lot of, <laughs> you got a lot of more stories. And we're going to get into one in a second. The second, because we're gonna, you're going to see them here. Many I'll be back. Times. Yeah. You yeah, can't, I'm, I'm, many more you can't get rid of me. I'm always around my brother, so you can't get rid of me yeah. most definitely, man. I you'll, appreciate see, you'll see him in some Q&As too. I'm going to try to talk him into doing with some other <sighs> people. 
<laughs> we'll put it together. But Tom, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I appreciate um, you, bro. Uh, I, and I'll be sending you a link to let you see it and things of that nature. Okay, okay. cool. I'm looking All for right. it. Thanks again, man. All right, I Vince. You enjoy it. your evening, bro. You do the same, brother. That recorded.